Hello and welcome to the Sport for Business Daily. We are joined this morning by Maria Kinsler. Maria is the chair of the Women's Gaelic Players Association and they have just produced a very detailed report levelling the field, looking at the effort and the energy that the female players are putting into Gaelic games and the rewards which they are, or in most cases, are not getting out of it. Uh, you're very welcome, Maria. Thanks, Rob. Thanks for having me. So tell us a little bit about why the report was undertaken and it was done in the in the, the weeks before COVID caused the lockdown. So that impact is not reflected in it, but it does give a good sense as to where we were and where we will be. Yes, yeah, so today we're, we've launched our Level the Field report um, where the data was collected in, in early 2020 in January and February, where we lived probably in a simpler world uh, pre-COVID and, you know, words such as um, returns to play, roadmaps, levels just didn't exist in our vocabulary. Um, but today's report, I suppose, highlights the challenges that face female intercounty players and also the priorities uh, for the next few years for the WGPA. The numbers in terms of the amount of time that players are putting in towards training and the playing of matches, uh, you know, upwards of 3.7 hours in contact time for each training session, and that happening five and six times a week. The, the, the effort going into that is immense, but one of the issues that it, uh, that it rises out of it as well is that there are no expenses being given for all of those trips to training, and with people having to make their own way now and avoiding carpooling and everything else, it's just got you know, three or four times more expensive. What way can we get towards improving that situation so people aren't having to actually dip into their own pockets to actually fulfill their desire to be the best that they can be? Yeah, so in our report, um, it details that the average length of training is an 80 kilometer round trip for our members. The average cost spent on fuel is 55 euros per week and 7% of our players only received travel and expenses. So I suppose you, you compare that to our male counterparties where they receive, I think, 65 cents per mile in the normal year. And this year it's reduced to 50 cents per mile for their traveling expenses. So there instantly there is a huge financial burden um, being shouldered by female intercounty players in an effort and a commitment to represent their county at the highest level. Um, to maybe touch on additional financial burdens that female players incur, um, 69% of our players pay for their own uh, gym fees, 60% contribute financially towards their own recovery costs, 55% pay for medical services, and um, you know it's just becoming increasingly unsustainable for female players to, to carry this burden. Um, I think when we look at possible solutions, um, I think we recognise this isn't a quick fix, this isn't going to be solved overnight and we don't expect it to. What we want to see is, you know, a pathway as to how, you know, equity and parity in Gaelic games as a whole, both male and female, can be achieved. Um, I think there's some innovation needed to be um, find some solutions. I think, you know, one area that I would like to target in particular is the discrepancy in the government funding um, between male and female intercounty players that currently stands at 77% uh, of a gap. So the male counterparties received 3 million in funding from our government in 2019 and the female intercounty player received 700,000. This isn't about taking away from the male funding that's fully earned and fully deserved. This is about getting equity and parity from our government funding um, for all female intercounty players. And there's also the question of equity and parity across the the social advantage or social disadvantage as well because if you're having to pay 55 euros a week that means that if you're in a household where there is very limited income and you're you know you're trying to do the best you can but on incredibly limited you're going to have to buy food rather than diesel to actually get to a training session so does that mean that we're actually turning elite sport into something which is really only open to the middle classes um, yeah, I, I, I think we are edging towards that. I think, you know, the girls do make financial sacrifices to when they commit to an intercounty setup uh, that's represented in the data we present today. 
Um, but yeah, I don't want to see inter-county Gaelic games just be a sport for middle-class people. It has to be accessible to everyone and needs to have grassroots participation. We're an amateur game and we need to um, honour that ethos. We are an amateur game and that has been uh, you know, consistently held the view that that's the best way of going about it. We see the challenges facing other sports now, particularly in terms of the costs of having a professional game and, and the real pressure that that's putting the sport itself under. But the, there are elements of it where the commercial world does come across. And we have been building up players as role models. Uh, they've been attractive to customers or to brands that want to attract customers. But there's a gap there as well in terms of the amount of money which, uh, you know, which players from Ladies Gaelic Football or Camogie are getting as opposed to the men's side. Of it. How has that arisen and what can we do to fix that? So um, our data showed that about 33% of our members participate in commercial activity. And by commercial activity, I, I, do, I do not include activities related to their clubs or their local communities. Um, and 65% of those 33% did not receive any expenses for their time or were compensated for their images or you know how the company um use them in national campaigns for female players i think you know this does need to change and one area where we are quite keen to develop is a wgpa rate card for commercial activity similar to what the gpa have where it's very clear um the national or for the different levels um what the fee is for players i think female players have historically you know, just got on with it and were maybe a little bit awkward about asking for money and actually valuing themselves um, and their time. And this needs to change. We have an education piece we need to do with our members around this and we're very much committed to doing so. And we've started that, that process this year with our squad reps. Um, and it's something that we will look to continue to develop with them. I think it's really important. And it's important as well for brands that if you're using... Uh, players in the, in this way, whether it be for images or interviews or anything else, that you should be asking the question, are they getting paid by the association or are you needing to dip into your pocket? Um, because it's only in doing that that you'll actually get the, the real change that comes about as a result of it. So the recommendations coming out of this report now are that uh, you, you want to get a greater, uh, you know, a closer working relationship with the, with the men's side of the game in terms of the player representatives. So the GPA and the WGPA moving closer together. What's there to stop that from becoming a single organisation over the course of the next 12 months? Yeah, so previously um, in the last 18 months, both the GPA and the WGPA members have passed motions at our respective AGMs um, to allow both executives to formalise this partnership. Um, so the WGPA executive have been working closely with the GPA um, since then to, to figure out what this partnership looks like and how it will operate. Um, that process is ongoing. Um, but personally, I don't believe that the GPA actually get the credit they deserve in their support for us. Um, they are our main source of funding. Um, and without them, the WGPA simply just wouldn't exist. We've seen over the last 12 months in particular, a lot closer alignment on giant initiatives, giant programs. Um, and I suppose that's the starting point um, for this formal partnership. And you know, we hope to be in a position where we can formalize that partnership um, soon. That's good to hear. Um, before I let you go, just a, a quick look. We're about to set off into a nine week Helter Skelter Championship across the ladies football. The Camogie is already underway, both of them heading towards all Ireland finals in December. What's the view of the players that you've been speaking to and that you're aware of in terms of them putting themselves out there when everybody else is being asked to stay at home and to avoid social contact? They're putting themselves on the road and onto the pitch. Is there, is there a general comfort with that or is there a slight sense of unease as well? I think there's probably two two ways the players view that. I think we, we absolutely recognise how privileged we are to continue to train and play a game that we love and to represent our counties and participate in, in the Championship 2020 at a time where our country and all of its people have, you know, 
face such difficulties and have um, complying with such restrictions and limiting you know their interactions and here we are we're very privileged to to be able to have our outlet and to continue to play um, but yeah, like like the the vast majority of um, the people, we there is slight concerns within um, players and anxiety related to that. But I think the return to play protocols that have been put in place have been implemented um, across all squads very well, um, and I think that has definitely helped to reduce the, the fears amongst players. Well, it promises to be a championship like no other, other. Um, and uh, very much looking forward to it. Uh, the copy of the of leveling the field is available. It's on the Sport for Business website at the moment, and uh, and at the WGPA website as well. Well worth having a look if you have any sense of uh, there being equality in sport. It's an important uh, benchmark to actually put out there. And for this morning, thank you very much to Maria Kinsler for your time. Thank you, Rob.